levantaré mi bandera Ando mi país o estando allá afuera Porque para mí, mira, no existen fronteras Yo levantaré mi bandera Whoa. Levantaré mi bandera Estando en mi país o estando allá afuera Porque para mí, mira, no existen fronteras No, no uh -oh. Y es que hay mucho sentimiento Lo grito al viento De ser latino, nunca me arrepiento Lo digo desde la Suiza Welcome to the latest edition of the Latin Babbler Show. I am your host, the Latin Babbler. I am here with my amazing co-host. Yeah, absolutely, Miss Rocky. Go ahead and sound off. Hola, hola. ¿Cómo estamos? Juan Ayala, host of Latin Arte and Actors with Issues. Mi gente, what's up, everybody? And Daisy Tornell, host of Cafecito con Daisy. Hello, hello. And our very special guest today has performed on Martin Lawrence's present. Presence, First Amendment stand-up. Comedy Central's Russell Simmons presents stand-ups at Array, Access TV's Gotham Comedy Live, BET Comic View, and uh, Comedy Central's Gabriel Iglesias presents Stand-Up Revolution. He can be seen on HBO Max, True TV, Showtime, Comedy Central, more. Welcome to the show, the Puerto Rican himself, comedian Mark Vieira. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. So, Mark, I got to apologize right off the bat because you're probably going to get a ton of cliche questions only because of this first time we've had a comedian <laughs> on the show. <laughs> so I know that you were born and raised in the mm. Bronx. And I got to ask you, what was it like? Because I hear nothing but horror stories from people about what it was like to grow up in the 70s and the 80s, that it was like a war zone. But then at the same time, these same people are all nostalgic about the time. So what was like the experience for you? Um, no different than that. You know, the Bronx was a, a tough place um, to grow up. But again, I always I tell this to anybody who wants to hear it. You know, it's all I know. And so, you know, the, the thing with the Bronx is that it is nostalgic because growing up hard, you know, allows you to sort of understand that reinventing yourself, um, pushing yourself out of that environment um, is, you know, it, it's a, unfortunately not a thing that many people can do because they're so stuck in their trend, in their mode you know, their, their surroundings becomes what defines them instead of allowing things that you do in your life, the things that you want to achieve in your life, be the things that define you. People say, I'm from the Bronx. I'll never leave the Bronx, you know, blah, 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 and all this other stuff. Whereas I've, my, my thing was, um, and, you know, old hip hop saying it, it's not where you're from, it's where you're at. And that has nothing to do with your physical. It has to do with your mental, you know, it has to do where you see yourself. Yeah. Where you see yourself in your mind and how you define where you want to quote unquote be, you know, Jay-Z is a billionaire. He started off selling drugs in Brooklyn, find him in Brooklyn now, unless he's going to the Barclays Center, you know, the, which in which he owns a portion to so, go out yeah. to game. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he's not going to sit there and say, Oh, I live in the same Marcy projects that I grew up in. That would be foolish. So I, I just, you know, I see it as, this is you know this, the thing is that you you don't pick where you're from you know you just are where you just are where you're from and so I'm grateful that you know the Bronx was my you know I'm, I always say it I, I'm not ashamed that the Bronx was where my story began it's just not where my story ends um, and that that has to do with me it has nothing to do with that I grew up with the city that I'm from New York City or anything like that it just has to do with where I want to be. Um, in my mind, you know, so it, it was hard. It was tough. Uh, but again, without without it being tough, without it being hard, there's no comedy because comedy was my saving grace. Being funny in my neighborhood was a way for me not to get my ass kicked every single day. So, you know, it, <laughs> it was it was a tool that I used sometimes to get out of fights. Now, that doesn't mean it always worked. I wound up fighting, you know, a, a small percentage of the time. But again, there were other times when I was like, I don't want to fight. You know, I just want to make this dude laugh and get it over with so that I don't got to do the next step. So it, it became sort of like my weapon of choice in a in a neighborhood where everybody was so tough that fighting was sort of like the only way to prove, uh, you know, my point. 
you know? And so I'm, again, grateful that, you know, my upbringing was tough, but that comedy was in, was in me very young, even back then when I was growing up and needed to be funny just to get out of stuff. Mark, so your mom was a social worker. Yes. She supported you guys. Yes. So tell us a little bit about that. Um, You know, she's still my best friend in the whole world. You know, my mom, she, uh, you know, t- a, a double-sided sword. My mother, um, yeah, she has such a Latino young. thing to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two sided. You know, de- definitely a, a, a dual sided sword. You know, was sharp on both sides. Meaning, you know, my mother was very um, driven to not be. She was super book smart, so she did not want to be left behind. She definitely wanted better herself and her sons. Uh, the problem is, is that, you know, she had a full-time job and she was going to school full-time. So in her 20s, you know, when I was just very young. So even though, you know, even though you know, she wound up getting her master's degree in social work and becoming and, and retired, you know, and heralded as one of the best social workers coming out of Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx, you know, she, you know, that, that cost her, you know, it cost her time with her sons. It cost us time with our mother in which my grandmother stepped in, you know, so we were grateful to have that. As we know, as Latinos, grandmothers perform many duties. And to my grandmother, I say she was a a queen of queens because she didn't have to step in. My mother could have paid for a babysitter or whatever. Uh, But my grandmother stepped in and said, no, 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 you know, you no me van a dejar los nene con cualquiera. And so, you know, she stepped in and she, uh, you know, we spent a lot of times, I would say within my first 10 years of life, I thought my grandmother was my mother. I thought my mother was my homeboy because we saw each other so sparingly, you know, because she was studying, you know, she was studying for midterm. She was studying for this. She had to do a thesis. She had to do this. She had to do that. You know, my mother was, she was busy, but again, she was very, very driven. I get a lot of myself from that, you know, from that drive. Your comedy is very hard. Comedy is very challenging. Uh, COVID comes up and now you have to redefine the what the hell do I do next thing. And so there's been a lot of, you know, there's a lot of peaks and valleys. And if I didn't have someone like my mom who showed me that the peaks and valleys are there to dis- to help you di- um, sh- kind of show how good you are at getting through all that stuff, you know, that stuff that you think is holding you back, but it's really teaching you these lessons about what it costs to be great at something. You know, being great at something, it doesn't matter that you go to work every day from nine to five and you're great at putting stamps on letters. That's fine. But that, you know, when you're when you create something and you want to be great at it. It's going to take it's going to take every ounce of you. Journey. Yeah, it takes every ounce, um, you know, out of you to gain to gain that. And so um it was hard, you know, so I, when people ask me that, they, I wish I could be like, it was great. My mom, you know, my mom talked to me about <laughs> everything. And she, we created and we still have that same relationship. It was very brother sister like, you know, instead of mother son. Um, so the, in my teenage years, when she needed to be a mom, I didn't really look at her for that. I looked at her more so that I can tell her what happened in my day how I, some kids spit in my face and I had to slap them and blah, blah, blah. And I got in trouble. Like, it was more like that. And then my, my grandmother was more like, no, I eso. you know, and she was very in my, you know, finger to my nose and the disciplinarian, disciplinarian. yeah, disciplinarian, <laughs> you know, so on and so on. My grandfather was like a pushover. You know, when I got in trouble, I went and cried on daddy, on my, on my grandfather's lap, you know, Papi, mami, me dijo que no, que no, que no. you know, and my grandpa <laughs> You know, because he didn't want yeah. her to hit us, and, you know, so he was more of the of the referee yeah, because I was always getting slapped up. I was, you know, I was a comedian since I'm little. I was always doing something and saying something I wasn't supposed to. So, um, but so the, the I was just the, about the, to ask you that. Were you like yeah, the annoying yeah. kid? <laughs> Of course. It's like, of everybody course. was like, Mark, shut up already. Like, what? Yeah, I'm still annoying. My woman it's is like, still like, Mark, are that's comedians. enough. Like, what voice Did are you, you get... doing now? What character are you doing now? You know? Did you get Seriously, class like... clown throughout like your the every school, Every school? year, clown? every year, every yearbook is, you know, um, class clown. destined to be on television, destined to be bliss. And, because I wouldn't shut up and I was always performing. If they give me a minute, I was performing. Always. 
So Mark, growing up, you know, uh, especially in the 70s and 80s was a huge time for TV sitcoms and comedies. So uh, what were some of your comedy inspirations growing up? Did you focus on any particular shows or was it more stand-ups for you? No, I didn't. I didn't watch stand up. You know, we didn't have I wasn't I, I wasn't. Uh, uh, how do you say uh, I wasn't privileged to have the channels like HBO and things like that. So uh, I watched everything that was on TV. What molded me c- character wise was some of the Spanish channels that we would watch. So um, my grandmother would watch a show called Chespirito. Um, and I would do, I would do all the characters, you know, I would do all the characters for my grandmother because I just wanted to see her laugh. You know, she was the one that worked all day. She was the one that came home and cooked. She was the one that cleaned. And so all I wanted to do was give her a little comic relief. And so when her show would go off, which was Chespirito, um, uh, all these shows that she watched, I would then become the characters in all those shows. Um, and have her just her and my grandfather just on the floor laughing because I didn't speak good English back then. I mean, good Spanish back then, but I could I could mimic, you know, I would mimic everything that they said. And that would make them laugh even more that I could pick up on all the things that they said. But when it came to like the shows that I loved, I know it's going to sound weird, but I loved every show that was led by a comedian. So I was, I grew up in a time where uh, Robin Williams was on a show called Mork and Mindy. And I get to, I got to watch Mork and Mindy weekly and I got to see Robin Williams perform. Like this dude was so hilarious on that show. So versatile. Yeah. The, um, C- Billy Crystal was on a show Nano, called Nano. Soap. Yeah. <laughs> Nano, Nano. Um, Billy Crystal was on a show called Soap. Um, so I love that. Yeah, I need to love that show. Um, and so I wound up, you know, I really wound up watching the sitcoms. Uh, uh, we used to watch a show called Three's Company. And so Jack mm-hmm. Tripper was like, he's yeah, like a god. He still remains a god to me in comedy because it was so much fun and so funny. And um, then I heard of a woman named Penny Marshall that used to go to my school. She was born and raised in the Bronx. Uh, she played in a show called Laverne and Shirley that I loved. You know, I loved the show Laverne that and Shirley. That was a good show. Yeah, it was a great show. It was a great written show. It was really, really funny. Um, so I, you know, I grew up like Happy Days, even though no one was a comedian on that show, but Happy Days, Three's Company, uh, Laverne and Shirley. Oh my God. And I was, you know, I was like a student. I was watching these shows with like, with grit, you know, because I was like, oh, my God, this is hilarious. And again, I would become the characters. Uh, sometimes on stage, I do a character from one of those shows and like four people die laughing. And all those people that never watched those shows just stare at the, you know, stare at me like what what character was that or whatever. Um, so t- TV in general was two sided for me. Number one, it was hel- it was hilarious. Like I said, full of some of the best stand up comedians to ever live. And the other one was, <clears throat> I didn't grow up in a, um, what do they call it? Like the nuclear family. Like I didn't grow up with like mom, dad, siblings, you know, and blah, blah. So it was fun for me to watch that happen. I tell people my, my father was all the dads on TV because I didn't have a dad, you know? So it was easy for me to, um, to sort, I don't know how to say it. Like, uh, um, I, there was a show called Good Times. I'm not sure if any of you had ever seen that show, but that show, Good Times, their father was tough, and he used to yell at them, and I used to feel like I was punished when that show came off. I used to be like, "Damn it, I didn't do all my homework. Damn it, I, you know, James Evans is going to whoop my ass. I better go do my, you know, I better go do my homework because, yeah, because I was, uh, I was being raised by the dads on television. I know that sounds weird and. But to me, that's what it felt like. It's the only dad, it's the, these are the only male influence dads that I knew were those, you know, were those guys. I can completely relate to that. I mean, I, you know, I didn't grow up, I didn't grow up with a dad either. So for me, it was, it was one of those things. You see some of these things like the Cosby show, you know, exactly. other, other shows, you know, family ties. There was quite a few shows out there that had like a nuclear family type yeah. appearance to it that when you, you sit there and look at it. You know, Growing like I said, pains. nuclear family, that uh, family going yeah. on where dad would come home from work. Hey, kids, how are you? Good. <laughs> come here and give dad a big hug. And I, you know, and I did, I'm like, I don't even have that. My stepfather used to come in and go, 
get out of my face, you jack. You know, get off the sofa. This is where I sit down. And it, it was just never, you know. And so in my, like you said, in my head, the wish, the want was being portrayed on television. So I would lose myself. You know, I, I would immerse myself. I felt like I was, you know, one of their family members. You know what I mean? Because I wanted that. And I didn't have that. I look back and I'm like, look at this horse shit that I got going on. You know, this crap I got going on in my house. This is so much better on growing pains than it is, you know, than it is here. So, so Mark, tell us the New York Rican tales of a New York Rican. Uh -huh. That's like your That's passion my life. project. That's your <laughs> That's life. life. Tell us I, a little I, bit about it. Like, how did that come into reality? Um, Tell us. Uh, you know, tales, tales of a New York Rican is really the story. It really is the mantra of my life, you know? First of all, I would like to say for everyone who watches this, listens to this, or ever hears this, New Yorican is a term coined by Puerto Ricans who had to move to New York at one time to better their lives because the life of Puerto Rico was just not, uh, 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 wasn't, uh, it, there wasn't enough upward mobility for them. So they felt like, like my grandfather, my grandmother, who felt like they can do better if they restarted in the land, right, of city. And so New Yorican came from that to those people that don't understand, you know, that I go to California when I, I, I coined this term, you know, tales of a New Yorican. They didn't know, you know, in California, they had no idea what I was talking about. They was like, hey, what's New, New York Rican? What is New, you know, they didn't, they didn't even know how to say it. And I'm like, wow, I can't believe that in New York it is, to say New Yorican is like to say, oh yeah, yeah, Puerto Rican from New York, I get it. And then you go to Chicago and they're like, ah, we don't, I don't, what does that mean? Like, tell us, you understand what I mean? Like, it was just so much, um, it was like pushback, you know, it was like pushback and I hated explaining it. You know, I hated breaking it down to this, like, it's like, stop, all right, like, Jeff, just spell it out and, and just, you know, anyways. So, um, again, it's nothing more than, than the story I care to tell about being this Puerto Rican kid from New York. But what I do with my stand-up, I feel, is I break all the barriers. Even though I'm telling my story, my New York Rican story, I think what my story does, it lends itself to every home that, you know, um, that will hear the connection, even though my stories are particular to my kind of world, you know, like my, the, the coffee joke and how you visit someone and they make their coffee from their land, you know, and us Puerto Ricans, we make, we make our cafe con leche or whatever it is, and we make it by hand. We make it, you know, the way we make it. And what happens is, is you have, you know, newbies that drink Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts, and they get a taste of Bustelo coffee done our way with the media and the, and the hot milk, you know, the whole milk, not almond milk, right? And then they get a, a that, that, that concoction hits their stomach, and they are like, I've, I couldn't get out of the bathroom for like 30 minutes because that Bustelo hit me like a rock. Like it was like a, <laughs> it was like a bomb exploded inside of me and I couldn't hold it. And I'm like, oh, you never had Bustelo before. And they're like, I just drink a lot of Starbucks. And I'm like, no, it's not the same, please. It's not even in the same ballpark. So I just mean, so, so Tales of a New Yorican encompasses even all those things. But I realized that I thought I was telling my story, but even just telling my story, I really am telling everyone's story because everyone has that. Everyone has a thing that they bring, whether it's Italians or Greeks, you know, they have a thing that they share with me and they go, oh, I know, right? Because from Greek, we bring, you know, uh, you know and then, you know, that thing, forget, and then you're like, oh my God, you laugh it, right? And it's sort of shared. It's not, I thought it was just me until I started doing it on stage. And the, and the, you know, the feedback from the audience was like, wow, I, you know, I have that same thing. I'm from Russia, but we have a similar, you know, it's like, it's like vodka in Russia, right? It's like, yeah, we wake up in the morning, we drink three shots vodka, then we go run, you know, we do 16 mile run. And you're like, what? Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? But we do our own, you understand? We do our own thing. So it, 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 it makes for good, a good sort of um, human connection. Even though I'm speaking about, like I said, being that New Yorkian kid, I think what happens is 
the bigger thing with comedy is that you wind up connecting on a human level. So, Mark, this is a question I've always wanted to ask a comedian. I know being a comedian is a true talent in itself, but how do you prepare before going on stage? You know, backstage is, uh, or, or before a show, it is what I call like quiet time. You know, it's just, it doesn't take long. I would say right around 30 minutes, sometimes depending on the size of the show, I might want a little bit longer time. But it's just breathing. It's sort of meditative for me. Um, and I don't want to look at anything. I don't want to listen to my old sets. I don't want to read books of my past, you know, my, my past comedy or whatever. I just want to, um, sort of self-reflect and build the set that I'm going to do in my mind. Sort of like if you can just close your eyes and imagine, you know, putting pieces of a puzzle together in your mind. That's how I do my set in my head before I go on. So I go, okay, I'm gonna open here. And so when I open with that, you know, here comes the other piece. And then I'm gonna go into, you know, women and their craziness. Then I'm gonna come down with, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know. So yeah, I, I'm just speaking honestly. Like, you know, and then I and then I see I don't know. I, it sounded very targeted. Daisy was the one that asked the question. <laughs> right. Well, this is for you then, okay? That's no, for you. Loca. Yeah. But, <laughs> the Latinas, he's he's targeting the Latinas. Yeah, well, I'm talking honestly, see, that's what's funny. I, this is exactly what, see, Tales of a New Eurekan is like, I'm targeting Latinas. But when I realized that I was sort of, uh, of closing the room in, now I just go, no, all of you women are out of your minds. All of you, because, <laughs> right, they all have the them. key to the universe. Yeah, they have the key to the universe. They're beautiful. They're, they're driven. They work. They, they, you know, they raise kids. They have babies and blah, blah. But they still... They they can't see themselves as as how, like we see them beautiful giant you know you say baby you look beautiful I like, leave me alone my stomach is killing me my foot hurt you know you're like oh my god I just I just think you look beautiful and I can't even right and so it's like uh, uh, so that to me is the craziness that that you know we sort of live in and try to figure out day to day but I'm you know in my mind see I, what's funny what's funny is. Oh, what's crazy is the way I think before I go on stage is that I'm never worried about the audience. You understand? I'm never saying, oh, no, the audience is not going to like the joke about the." You know what I mean? Like, I'm always just trying to find the me in the set before I go on so that I know, like, some days I may not want to talk about this. So I just take that out. You know, I just sort of in my my mind's whiteboard, I just erase it, you know, and I put something else there. So this way, when I'm on stage, I'm not hunting for the next topic. I kind of know where I want to go so that it flows like water. Um, it sounds like a difficult thing, but doing it all this time, it, that's the easiest way Second for me. nature. Yeah, yeah, because then the audience doesn't ever catch me um, going, yeah, um, so... You know, so what else? Um, yes. Uh, Yo, I've seen that. that. I want, you know. Yeah, of I've course. So that. I. I was I at the saw. Laugh Factory here in L.A. And one of the comedians was telling jokes. And I think, I think it was halfway through. He was completely lost. It was to yeah. the point where <laughs> it was just a long pause. He actually lost his whole set to the point where he started talking to the guy at the bar who was the comedian that came on before to try to feed off of him yeah. so that he can try to tell it. It was so bad. It was so bad. So I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I, and that's, see, what's funny is that's happened to me before, you know, I've lost my sort my train of thought. And then I'm like, damn it. What did I want to, I know there was something that I want to put in there, but that has nothing to do with the audience and everything to do with how I want to move on stage, you know, and it has nothing to do with physical. It's everything to do with what's in my mind, you know, how I want to move so that the audience doesn't see me sort of fumble around with ideas and thoughts and words. And I like my, my set to feel very, you know, very connected. I don't like to see people get, watch me get off a topic, get on a topic, blah, blah. You know, when, when it's 60 minutes that's done when I'm on stage, I like people to go, oh my God, it's over. Or I love when the audience goes more and more, you know, and I so listen, I got to get ready to go. And they're like, no, you know, that's my favorite because I'm like, wow, it's been 60 minutes 
and you guys still want more? Like, you you know, three of you have gone to pee. Nobody got to pee? I got to pee. You know, so it's like, it's one of those things where you're like, what the hell? But, um, yeah, I, for me, the, the backstage or the behind the scenes, the BTS stuff is, I'm just chill. I'm just like, you know, I want to, I don't mind listening to people have small talk because I'm not listening. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, I'm, I could hear them, but I'm not listening. I'm in my own head and I'm sort of watching the waves crash against the, you know, the surf. And I'm just in my mind going, okay, I want it to look like this. I want it to move very smoothly. And, I, you know, so if I did a show already, now I have an anchor point where I can go, oh my God, that was great. Everything, the only thing I would change is instead of saying and here, I would say or here and move it along. You know, so I, I even do that. I do editing in between shows you know, and go, all right, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to repeat. That didn't go the way I wanted it to. So I'm going to take that out. Gives me an opportunity, you know, gives me an opportunity to do what's called a, like a, like a quick fix. Like when a, uh, you know, I'm watching football now, but you know, during halftime, they make necessary adjustments. I do the same thing when I'm doing my shows and I have a break. So I do a show at eight o'clock. Then I have a show at 10 o'clock. I have a break to make any necessary adjustments and say that that didn't work, you know? So sometimes you have the most beautiful thing happen, which is the audience starts to drive your comedy. And now you're working almost in tandem with them, you know, uh, like back and forth, like, like tennis, you know, and they're, and they're hitting stuff back. And you're, you know, I uh, ask, Hey, uh, are you guys married? Oh yeah, yeah. How long are you married? 48, 48, you know, now I go on a whole exploratory thing as to how the hell do you get to 48 years? And then we, you know, and through their answers lives comedy, obviously, because 48 years is not easy. Sometimes the husband will say, I have no idea how this happened, you know, and, and, then, and then more, and then comedy lives right in those answers. And so you just, you know, sometimes, but I, I'm grateful that I'm not one of those comics that has to follow a script that I can't do that. I can't, I can't talk with them. Or if somebody yells, Yo, Marty! you know, and I'm able to, bounce a little banter off and then go back to whatever stand up is left on stage so a, a, a great question but again for me the the it's very similar every pre show which is just like even if i got to drive like wednesday i drove down to miami uh, i live in west palm beach an hour drive from west palm beach down to miami so even the drive is like quiet no music very internal small talk, but really I'm just like, you know, just breathing, listening to myself breathe, knowing that when I get on stage, I want to give them my best. So I have to do my process. I don't like to argue beforehand. I don't like to argue after a show, you know, because people don't care, right? You, have, you know, it's whatever. But I, I, for me, it's like, all right, if you want to argue, do that another day, another time. Right now, I'm, I'm in my own, I need my space. Yeah, I need my, kind of like my own space. So. All right, Mark, I got a question. Um, so you went on tour with, with Mark Anthony, actually. And then from there, your career just kind of like shot up right after the New Yorican uh, special. And then you actually got to work with Gabriel Iglesias in the stand-up revolution that was on Comedy Central. How did that even happen? I mean, did you guys like connect at one point? Did his agents call your agents? Did he call you directly? How did you guys get connected for that? Um, it, it's a long, it, it's like a long time in the making. Gabriel and I had worked together in the past. Um, whenever he would come to New York, he would, you know, uh, tell someone to see if I was available to host. Um, he wanted a New York comic to host with him, uh, on oh, the great. show in New York city. And so we started to build sort of like a, more of a, a like a friendship then. And then with Stand Up revolution, yeah, it was like I got a call from someone in his camp and they were like, Gabe wants you to audition for his show that, you know, wants you on season one of his show or season two or whatever of his show on uh, on Comedy Central. You know, would you like to do it? Now, I got to be honest with you. I was just like, I got to audition I just said that. I was like, what? what? <laughs> yeah, I was just like, ay, yay, yay, yay. But, you know, uh, people that were close to him that I knew were like, nah, he just wants to see if you can work clean because he's a cleaner comic. He wants to know yeah, yeah. if you're able to bring laughs without being dirty, you know, without having to curse, without having to refer to, you know, your genitalia, your, you know, butt crack and, and all this 
you know, the, what, what sometimes, <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you go see a comedy show yeah. and sometimes you got to take a shower because the comic didn't stop cursing and for, for real, real. It, you know, I'm sorry, but you know, and that's, that's kind of the, I've stayed away from that kind of comedy, but again, but I curse. If you see me in a nightclub, I, I talk kind of like the way I talk sort of normally. Yeah, I wish, yeah. I wish I didn't curse so much sometimes, but that's, you know, we're still all a work in progress. But anyways, so yeah, his people got connected with me. I, you know what? I was in LA. I was actually doing some other shows. This thing came up and I said, all right, I'll go. And so he was hosting this great night of comedy, but he was actually doing auditions. He only wanted me to do five, six minutes. Um, I went up there, I did five or six minutes, had the audience on the floor. And so, you know, he told me that night, he goes, you know, get ready because you're going to be taping because I, I definitely want to use you. When I taped for him and the set went so well, he was like, you know, again, we spent the whole day together because we were taping, you know, so yeah. wound up spending a lot of time together. He's asking me about my workout stuff because obviously he's a little on the heavier side. So he was like, Mark, how much do you work out? Because I don't understand. You know, you look good. Blah, blah. He just, you know, he he's kind of like he wanted somebody around him that wasn't trying to be like him, you know. Uh, uh, and so, I, I, you know, I... I would talk to him about how I ate and how I worked out. And he would just be like, I can't believe it. I don't believe someone actually does this on purpose and all this <laughs> other stuff. And then, and then, yeah. And then we, we created like a cool friendship, which then, you know, kind of peaked when he started this new tour and his host, uh, Martin Moreno, um, needed a break. He was just, I don't know, 15 years of traveling and all this other stuff. He just got tired. He got burned out, you know? And uh, Fluffy's a particular kind of human being. He's a party animal in a way. He likes to celebrate his victories. And you can lose yourself, you know, in someone else's, you know, hey, come party with me, man. You know, I'm Fluffy. I'm giving all you guys that. We're going to, you know, let's drink tequila <laughs> until 7 a.m. and blah, blah. And I was just like, listen, I'll drink a couple of drinks and then I got to go to bed because I'm going to the gym at 9 a.m. And he didn't understand that language. He thought that I would break, you know? And so even though it was the most fun because my first time, like on a tour bus, sleeping in my own little cabin on the yeah. tour bus, you know, <laughs> uh, I did that for a year and it was just tons of fun. We would fly in to one city and then on the bus through the rest of the cities. Um, and it was so much fun. We had, a, we, you know, we had, we had a great kinship, he and I, which meant I was, a, I'm a little older than he is. Um, I had, I'd done some things differently than he, because he started comedy in his teenage years. I worked, you know what I mean? I had sort of a regular job life and, um, I was able to sort of lend to him what it is and, you know, what it looks like to be a normal person who then finds his way into something like great like this as comedy. And he would he would be like, you know, uh, like this, you know, listening to my stories like you, you know, like you guys said about the Bronx, about growing up, you know, he had his own thing and I had my own thing. So he we, we had a great kinship. I, friendship is both down here. We had a kinship that was really nice for a while. Um, and then it just dissipated, you know, just like everything else. I, I hate to say it in show business is things come and go and you have to be able to move fluently through that, through all of it. Yeah, I actually saw him live. Well, my kids actually bought it, bought tickets for, and he, that was the time that he was actually struggling with his, or his relationship. And so it was, it was the first time I saw him in like such a humble situation. So it was, you know, I asked that because yeah, it's very interesting to, to see that. Um, and the evolution of how, even how comedians work. So, Mark, about a year ago, there was a stand-up competition that was part of the New York Latino Film Festival, and you were one of the winners. Um, so, you know, being able to perform in front of a live audience in the HBO Entre Nos, the winner special. So how many comedians uh, competed for that? How many people were you up against? Um, it's going to sound crazy. 300. I heard there were 300 applicants. So 300 submissions of comedy um which was narrowed down i was a top 10 
And then after a top 10, they had the five last, you know, so they had like a top five and then a bottom five. Um, and so they, uh, they being HBO and the uh, um, New York Latino Film Festival, they narrowed it down by sort of, you know, what they did was they had five on the top of the leaderboard and then they had like some extras in case there were any issues. So it's almost like they had a top six or seven that they wanted to use for this first competition. Um, and so I was on that, I was on that top five list. Um, and then, so they had a finals um, for all those comedians to participate, you know, to participate in for the right to be on the next Entre Nos special. Um, again, did I want to do it? The answer is unequivocally no. Again, I've been on tour with some of the biggest names in Latin, in the Latin world, you know, from Mark Anthony to Gabriel Iglesias. Um, so I didn't feel like doing it. And then I got a call from my best friend at the time who had just been diagnosed with stomach cancer, Angelo Lozada. And Angelo called me on the phone and he said, I need you to do this. And he goes, and I don't want to hear no. So just send send five minutes. I know you have, because I would keep catalogs of five minutes here and there from all over my, 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 you know, my different shows. So I picked five minutes. I sent it to them. Uh, it was current. It was a good, you know, a good recording it was clean. The audience was crying, laughing. And then on the night of that, that final show, I put together a set that would make Angelo proud. Angelo, again, my mentor, my best friend, who I knew was ailing, and I know he wanted me to win. You know, I know that before cancer took him, he wanted to see me rise to that next level that I was deserving of. And he knew that I was sometimes standing in my own way. So he just basically said, can you please get out of your own way and do this, not for me, but for you. And I, I, you know, I obliged. I said, all right, I'm going to do this, man. You know, I'm going to do this. I told him, but I only know how to do things all the way. I, I'm not a half-ass person. So I wrote a set that I knew if it didn't win me this, this thing, <laughs> I was not, I wasn't good at comedy. You, you know what I mean? Like, because writing a set is one thing, but knowing that you can perform it to a high level is something else. So I prepared a set that I knew. I said, listen. I've been working on this set for a minute. What I did was I, uh, again, I piecemealed, I took from here, there, and I put it together into this one like seven, eight minute powerhouse of a, of a set. And, um, and I went for it. You know, I went that night, I said, I'm here to win. I'm here to win. Angelo was one of the judges amongst, you know, like I said, some of uh, uh, the person who runs the New York Latino Film Festival, people from HBO, didn't know, didn't know me from anything. They were just there to judge. It was just there to judge the comedy that night to see who dominated the night. And, uh, you know, I went, I went for broke. I said, you know, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go. Like I said, full tilt. And so I gave it everything I had, man. And um, they chose, uh, again, at the end of the night, I was a winner. They also picked a second winner um, in Alex Caravaño, a Colombian comedian out of Brooklyn. Very, very, very funny dude. Um, and he, again, I think he did the same thing. He went for it all. Um, but I think if you watch both sets on the Entre No special, you kind of get to see what the difference is between the two styles of comedy and the two places that they are in the world of comedy. Because we, you know, it's 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 his set than my set, you know, sort of back to back or or the other way around, my set and his set. And you kind of get to see. I watched it as it happened, as it aired, and I was just like, wow, I, I you know, this is it, this is it's not it's. It's night and day. It's like, wow, this is night and day. This is sort of, you can tell, wow, one guy has been doing it for a while and one guy is, you know, is newer at it. My favorite bit was the, uh, the, uh, the birthday, <laughs> birthday bit. The Facebook the emojis. <laughs> that yeah. is the yeah, Facebook yeah, 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 emojis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. The, at the very end where she's sitting there going, she's like, no, because what happens is I'm getting ready so we can go over to yeah, the birthday party. On, let's like, go. She never yeah, dropped you want to send, send bitches oh. cakes and balloons on Facebook? Yeah, come on. Let's go. I want to have some of her cake. <laughs> it was so hilarious. That was, you know. That's great, though. No, you didn't send her one cake. You sent her two cakes because, you know, so we have to have, like, it was, 
Yeah. I, you had me yeah. rolling, man. Uh, I was, you, so I was you must know her really since good. you sent her two cakes and a balloon. Yeah. You know her from where? Where you know her from? Which is, such, you know, which is such every woman's interview process. You know, they always have to make you feel like you don't know anything. You don't know. And if you do know, why? Why do you know? How do you know? How do you, you know? <laughs> Yeah, and that, you know the thing I love about your comedy is that it's so relatable. So if you're like Latino growing up, every every single one of these sketches that you do have like a piece of everything. I got one clip that I'm going to show before I ask my last question, and it, it was one once that I saw that was on IG. But I know about this, so I don't know whoever doesn't know about this. But this is like raw. This is real. So hold on one second. Makes the mommy makes the Right? She don't even she don't even know how many people are coming. <laughs> mommy don't know. Mommy. Right? <laughs> mommy don't give a f mommy don't care. Mommy goes, get the oil. Now you gotta now you gotta climb a fucking it's in the top. Mommy, the big oil, the big the big pot. <laughs> that shit is <laughs> Right, it's not the rice. It's the it's the it's that pot. That pot has been through three wars. That pot has been passed down from family to family. That shit went through Vietnam, the Gulf War. This shit been around, and that shit is burnt in the right places. <laughs> That's crazy. No solid. That so burnt. No yeah. solid. No, that sad, bro, it's it there. Not it only that, you ever touch inside. the inside, it's always oily. You could wash that with Dawn. You can get, you can get windshield wiper <laughs> fluid. You can get, you can use 96 Brillo pads, bro. Eso tiene un aceite que no le sale. It's like, mommy, but, and, and that's how she wants it. She wants it with a little film on it because, you know what I mean? It's, it, it's her, it, it, it coats it. It's, it coats it. It coats it. it it's it a part of the it Oya. It's, it's a part of the, the, the aura that is the Oya, right? Like it's, it's just a song of ancestors <laughs> past. Like it's, <laughs> exactly. It's, it has it's, a little, it's, it's the oil from the skin of the coqui in Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> that shit got, when you, when you rub the Oya, that's what you hear. That shit, that shit got a little. I see. I'm that is you. hilarious. I'm, I'm telling you, that's the the, the Oya is magic, bro. The Oya is magic, it, and it makes <laughs> when magic. The golf wars, whatever. yeah. I was look. I had. I, you I can see a soldier. That. You can see a soldier with his gun, his all his stuff, and he has an Oya right back Oya here. The and look, yo. <laughs> If you guys get hungry, let me know. I got the oil. <laughs> Mommy sent me the oil in my care package so I can make something for you guys. That's so these guys just, Mind you. These guys got bombs going on. He's making, he's making arroz fresco. Mira, tengo a Carolina. Arroz Carolina for everyone. Oh, my goodness. He, we're, look, Carolina, we're going to be we're gonna be posting this, so you got to, like, sponsor us for that oh one. It's right? right? Uh, arroz Carolina. Mind Carolina, right. Your boy Mark Vieira needs a sponsor. Right, right here. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, for me, look, I, I've watched, I've watched quite a few bits. I, I died because it's just like even the beeper. Uh, when Crying you're talking right about now. the beepers, oh, the, oh, yeah, I am too. Uh, like my eyes are watering. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just I got like, like triggered because that was me growing up. On top up. of the fridge, that's for life. Uh, but yeah, because let me let me tell you, every Latin household, all the ollas are in the oven. They're mm -hmm. all so you have too. to clean the oven out. When mommy starts to cook, the whole oven, the whole oven has to come apart, right? Yeah. Because yeah. all the Oyas are in the <laughs> oh oven. God. But that big Oya, the Oya for everybody, is somewhere like... It's up, it's up at the top, man. <laughs> yeah, Dude. it's on the fridge. It's on the... You didn't even know there was two tops of the refrigerator. There's like the top you can see and then the top you don't see. So mom... <laughs> <laughs> you have to do with the ladder. Get, get the ladder and me recoge la olla que no lo necesito. Que oh, viene gente. Si, si, que venía gente. She did, Mommy, but how many people are coming? No te apure, dame la olla. La olla made enough she for made, everybody. And people took home. Dirty. Yeah, oh, people took over. home. I'm like, yo, yeah, she's right. so gangster that people took home. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> she's feeding the troops. It's hilarious. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Uh, oh my God, and you're not allowed favorite. to misplace it either. You're not allowed to leave it at what? another house. Like my you mom can't will make sure. It. You can't no. lend it. No. 
No. <laughs> um, and this is what's funny. My mother, my grandmother passed away for you. My mother has her Oya. And my mother laughs at that joke because she's like, I have I have mommy's Oya in the kitchen. <laughs> It was in the she well. doesn't use it because that it's the big one. It's people the, because there's ollas and then they call it a, a caldero, which is like the the the, the cauldron that witches use to make yeah. special yeah. The, to make uh-huh. special you know, to, to make the potions rolls, to, to make the like brew. That, wait, wait, you see little 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 spiders go, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know it's green smoke. Like, it's, 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 it's for you know, <laughs> you know, but. <laughs> <laughs> the caldero, forget it. That God. big olla, that, that's the monster olla. That's for Thanksgiving, right? Christmas. It only, Bro, it's you only get everything. that olla when it's like a special occasion. The other ollas, yeah, the little one. Que para nos, para nos otro, you know, that's different. That, that big one, that's some the cousins. other little ollas. Yeah, that's the one cousins. that gave birth to go the little ollas. <laughs> the mother olla. That's Oya. how you know you're eating good when yeah, you see the big olla come out. Yeah. The, the mother, mother olla. olla. <laughs> God, I'm dead. That's hilarious, man. <laughs> so, oh my God, we got to get back on schedule here. All right, so, so now you're a huge believer on giving back, and I think that's that's a very cool thing because you even mentioned how it's it's important for you not to forget, you know, about your roots, where you come from, and so you because of that you've done shows back in the community, like for the Make a Wish Foundation. You had like the VIP Drug Rehabilitation Center back in the neighborhood. Um, and you're always doing like performances, you know, at like local comedy clubs. Why is that like so important for you? Um, well, again, what happens is, is when you start comedy, when, you know, when I first started comedy, these are the things that I did unknowingly, unknowingly, right. That I wasn't getting paid for it, but I was like, I would love to just be there because the bigger name comics at the time were all participating. And I, so they would say, Hey, you want to come do this show? And I'd be like, Sure. And slowly and surely, as those comedians either moved on, moved on in their lives, moved away or did whatever, you know, the responsibility still fell on the comedians that were still, quote unquote, local to, you know, to the New York City roots. And so, yeah, there were college shows that I would do for organization, college organizations that they were like, Mark, we don't have a budget. And I would say, don't even worry about it. You know, I'll bring two or three comedians with me. Uh, for, you know, uh, especially around uh, Hispanic Heritage Month and things like that, where I know we could represent our community at a high level. And so it it still goes on today. It still goes on today where these community organizations, again, from the hospital where my mother worked for, which is Montefiore Medical Center in New York City, uh, in the Bronx, which is huge now. Now it's like Montefiore um, Hospital something or the other where they're the one number one hospital association in New York City um, or in the Bronx specifically. And so when they call, I come running, you know, I try to do everything I can to uh, sort of bring the laughs to the community that I grew up in. I, I never want to be bigger than that. You know, I never want to be more than than that, because, again, when I was first starting out, those doors were open for me as well. Even though I was entertaining them, I needed that just as much as they needed me. And now that I don't need them, it feels ridiculous not to go back and perform for them. Even though I, you know, I'm I'm at a certain level in my career, I actually love it. I actually love that a lot of them will say, "I saw you on TV," you know. And I hate to say it, these are like former crackheads and former <laughs> heroin addicts, but. You know, hey, it's love. You know, love is love. And they're like, yo, yeah, for sure. And you're just like, and you're like, oh my God, that's, you know, that, listen, that's a heroin heroin out of federal, you know, that's okay. No, I remember, Papo, I remember. That's all right, right here. And I just, I'm just in love. I hate to say it. I'm in, if you love my comedy, I love you back. I I don't care if you just did a hit of cocaine in the bathroom and you're trying to get over your woes. You know, I I have a I guess I have a soft spot for for the love from my community. It's like some people say, why do you go back? And I go, I love the love of my community. I really do. You know, the Bronx, the Bronx is the people I can I can't get away from my soul. Right. And, And the Bronx is a part of my soul, man. It's just it just is so. You know, wherever I go and wherever I end up, the Bronx will always be with me. 
It'll always be with me. It's a part of me. So, Mark, who are some of the comedians that um, you recommend to others to watch right now? Are there any up and coming names or any folks that you admire that we should be watching? Um, I mean, there's just a there's a, a world of funny. You know, there's a there's a community of funny. There's a uh, an Iranian comedian named Maz Jabrani who is masterful. You know, uh, and and I would say only saying outside of the names that we already know. You know, uh, if people aren't associated or understand Chris Rock, they need to watch him. He's hilarious. And he's, you know, he's in a place where he sees the world differently. Um, And his comedy comes from a very unique, um, very defined place. I love Chris Rock to this day because I feel like we share a similar kinship because he comes from Brooklyn hard, raised hard, not with no without much. And he's reached a certain level of success, but he can see the world from a place where... Different location, yeah. Yeah, and he makes it unique. He makes it very unique. So I I love, I really do enjoy Chris Rock comedy. And then the the obvious, Chappelle's Kevin Hart, even though Kevin, through the years, obviously, it's like he's sort of a watered-down version of the beginnings of Kevin Hart. Um... I still think he's still very good at what he does, you know, very, very good at what he does. But like like a Jim Gaffigan, if people don't know that name, kind of watch I that. Just saw, I just saw him yeah, uh, a couple of days ago. <laughs> yeah, he's massive. He's, so, he's, so, he's like, you know, you can rely on funny with Jim Gaffigan. You just rely on it. You know, there's a guy named Tom Papa that's so funny. Um, uh, Wanda Sykes, you know, I tell people to me, Wanda Sykes is the number one female comedian in the country. And if you missed her last Netflix special, you did yourself a disservice. She's incredibly funny. And so she's and she's very good at what she does, you know. And, and I tell people, if you ever watch puzzle, when I say puzzle pieces coming together, watch how these comedians do it. You know, it's very clear that they've taken this, 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 and this, and they put it into one beautiful piece of work, you know, uh, uh, Chris Rock does that, Chappelle does that, and you can see it, you go, oh my God, he, he started with, you know, bacon on the, on the fryer, and he ended his show with bacon on the fryer, and so you knew that he had pieced everything together, so, and packaged it so nicely, so, um, and then up and, up and coming, that guy, Alex Carabaño from, you know, from uh, Colombia, super funny dude, Dominican kid named Ian Lara, um, out of New York City, we you know we did the Entre No stuff together. Uh, he's super funny, man. He's on the rise. Um, you know the guy who hosted the Laugh Mobs, Laugh Tracks on True TV, Cipher Sounds, uh, funny, funny, funny. You know, funny guy. So he's a great dude. You know, great guy and funny dude. But you know, there's a there's a world of comedy. You know, world of comedy that and and in, and in the Latin community, Ida Rodriguez, who has uh, Love Ida. you know just did her HBO Max Love Ida. special. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Ida, uh, Gina Brion, you know, these are my these are my sisters, and they they are, I mean, by far they they set they set this Latin community on fire because they speak, you know, they speak for us in in their humor, and I love them both. You know, I love them them you know so much. If you if you speak to Ida, let her know we're we're looking for her. All right, I will. <laughs> and, and let me tell you, man. You know, she knows that I have some tenure on her and she listens to what I say. So, you know, if you guys, you know, want me to let her know to, to come through with you guys, hey, I definitely will. I, I've tried different avenues. I've tried different avenues. I'm throwing my okay. shot here. This is my my version of my shot. So, you know how publicists yeah. are. I got you. <laughs> Good I got Lord. you. Don't worry about it. So where, yeah. Mark, where can they find you as far as like follow you? What shows you got coming up? <laughs> well, I mean, Mark they're not going to go to your T-shirt. <laughs> go to my T-shirt. Wherever you see my T-shirt, Click on his t-shirt. that's where you go. You, um, <laughs> just uh, markviera.com. So all things Mark Vieira are on my website, markviera.com. Uh, I just got some no tour dates that, that'll be up in the next couple days. Um, but yeah, I'll be in... Um, I'll be in Albany, New York, Richmond, Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia, Grand Rapids, Michigan, um, Orlando, Florida, with this tour that I'm on called the New York Kings of Comedy. Um, And so, yeah. And so, you know, uh, these different projects, God willing, will allow for the rest of the earth to see what, you know, what this is. Because even though it's, 
the you know tales of a new eureka and it really is you know everyone's story that's amazing Every, Man, everybody's look. grandmother everybody's grandmother has an oil everybody yeah <laughs> That's going to be that. You know what? I'm going to name that as the title of the show for this interview. Watch. I'm just going to be like, everybody's got an Oya. Everybody's grandmother got an Oya, right? Swedish, <laughs> gr- Russian, you know, Greek. Everybody's grandmother got an Oya. So Mark, it, it don't it's, matter. It's been absolutely amazing, man. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us. I knew this was going to be a great interview. I love your story. If you guys haven't caught them, go catch them now. Look, on HBO Max, if you go look at it, right now. you can turn around and find them right now because he's amazing. He's actually funny. The Latin assassin is what they call him. Folks, <laughs> that is our show. You can listen to us on our neighborhood radio on Radio89.com and literally on every popular app. Follow us on social media at Latin Babbler Show. Visit our website, www.latinbabbler.com. And go subscribe to our new YouTube channel. I'm the Latin Babbler. For everybody, we are out. Desde Nicaragua hasta Costa Rica, con esta canción todo mundo se identifica. Llamen a los chilenos y a los cubanos, llamen a Puerto Rico y a los mexicanos, que ya se armó la rumba. Desde Panamá hasta Ecuador, vámonos a Perú y luego hasta El Salvador. Que se escuche Brasil y Argentina. Estando en mi país o estando allá afuera Porque para mí mira no existen fronteras Yo levantaré mi bandera